is there room in our cities for poor people? Last time I was here uh, chairing politics in the pub, we were talking about homelessness and I think I prefaced the introduction of our speakers with a polite but courageous expression of utter outrage that in Australia tonight there is just shy of 120,000 people who have nowhere to sleep. They are the poorest of the poor. They can't afford cheap housing. They can't afford social housing. They can't afford anything. And as a card-carrying member of a leading political party, which disgraces me in itself, that particular party, like other parties in Australia that purport to be able to lead government in Australia and in New South Wales, have been manifestly incompetent when it comes to fixing the problem. It's not a big problem when you are as affluent and as wealthy as this nation. The fact that there's one person sleeping rough tonight would be a national disgrace. The fact that there's 120,000 of them is a complete and utter disgrace. And the solution is very simple. And we're very fortunate tonight to have two speakers who can share with us some of those solutions. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Peter Phibbs uh, and Mary Perkins. Mary Perkins is the Executive Officer at Shelter New South Wales and she's very uh, helpfully been handing out a brochure this evening. Shelter New South Wales unites the voices of low income tenants and non-profit organisations working on their behalf. They conduct research, teaching and advocate to government to make housing more affordable and make the housing system work better for low income earners. Shelter is a not-for-profit, non-government organisation. It's not aligned with any political party. It's not aligned with any commercial venture or organisation. Mary's work has included significant work through organising teaching and raising community awareness through lectures, including a lecture series on urban issues and a large number of programs designed to advocate for and be the voice of this most vulnerable group within our community. Wonderful to have you both here. Please join me in welcoming Mary and Peter. And uh, Mary, Mary is going to be Thanks for the introduction. That sort of sums shelter up quite nicely in lots of ways. But I think I might just take it a bit further and say, for us, housing isn't just about a roof over a head. It's about so much more. It's about <clears throat> in that how we make our housing so that it enhances the well-being, the engagement and participation within our society. It's about housing of a decent quality that's appropriate to disability, to ageing, to cultural needs. But it's also about our neighbourhoods being good places to live in, about planning places that encourage connections between people and services and between people. So to us, when we're talking about a fair housing system, what we're talking about is a housing system that would enable all the citizens in this society to find their housing in the right place, at the right price, with the right amenity, and above all, with the security that they need. Unfortunately, that isn't the case today, and many people are doing it pretty tough. We have a housing system that divides rich and poor, that divides generation against another, there's lots of winners in our housing system, there's enough money in our housing system, but some people get all of it and other people get none. Um, so it's a very divisive housing system that we have. But before I go into why that is so, um, and how simple the solutions are, they're very simple, we've got money, we need to redistribute it. Um, redistribution has never been an easy thing, so it ain't as easy as you might like. But let me just look at our topic for today. Will there be a place for poorer people in our cities? And let's look at history. Throughout the history of urbanisation, poor people have been kicked around, without a doubt. Um, and in Sydney, in particular, since the 60s and 70s, we've had a process of urbanisation that has concentrated richer and more wealthy people in the centres of our city, which was the converse of what had happened for the 
few decades before, the centre of our cities were poorer and the outer suburbs were richer. Um, the 60s and 70s saw significant urban redevelopment. It was the period in which organisations like mine were formed, Tenants Union, New South Wales, Shelter. We all came out of the resident action groups of that time. Um, we saw Sydney grow, CBD grow. We saw different institutions like the universities, the hospitals, and various other places sort of grow. And we saw a huge amount of gentrification. During that process, <clears throat> We lost something like 80% of Sydney's low-income private rental housing. None of that was replaced anywhere else in Sydney at the time. And for me, who was working at the Tenants Union in New South Wales at the time, it was a time that we witnessed the most awful hardship as families were evicted. Evictions took place street by street. These were private tenants. They had no legal rights at that time. At that time, there was also a lot of community objection to the amount of roadway expansion. Is that familiar with West Connex? There was also a lot of objection to the destruction of our building heritage. Um, and we had things like the green bands and what have you. Um, and a lot of resident action groups, what have you. There was enough social disquiet, if you like, that there had to be some political settlement to the unrest. And that political settlement saw us come out with environment and planning acts that protected our heritage and made planning processes a little bit more accountable than they had been seen to be before. We saw greater protection of our building type heritage, so places like the Rocks and Victoria Street were protected. We got a promise, it took 10 years to make the promise good, a tenancy reform. At that time, tenants were governed by legislation that was 100 years old. Um, we saw Woolloomooloo and Glebe be developed as public housing estates. Glebe, it was owned by the Church of England and it came across to what was then the Housing Commission and Woolloomooloo was redeveloped and old houses rebuilt but new houses built within it. Um, and there were other sorts of quite significant public expenditures on housing in the inner city at the time. The growth of public housing in that time was seen as a way of ameliorating the hardship and compensating lower income households for the housing that they were losing. So we saw Sirius down at Miller's Point, the rocks built specifically for the households that were being displaced by the amount of redevelopment that was taking place then. It's significant that back then the, the displacement of poorer households was the displacement of poorer private tenants. Today we see another displacement taking place, but it's the displacement of public tenants. That very same public housing that was invested in back then to ameliorate the hardship caused by the amount of development and the displacement of poorer households is now being used and considered to be used to, for the redevelopment without any, as I can see it, significant amelioration of the hardship that will happen or justification for why it should happen. Um, <clears throat> so in today's urban development, we see a whole lot of pressure again on whether or not there's going to be a place for poor people or poorer households in our cities. And Peter will talk about a lot of the economic reasons for that and why that's happening. But let me just focus a bit on the, the housing system and why it works the way it does now, why its problems are a little bit different to what they were back then, although when you look, the seeds were being sown then. When I'm talking about a housing system, I'm talking about our three major tenure forms, home ownership, private rental, and public rental. They all work together and they become our housing system and they serve different sorts of functions. Um, and we know that in our private rental market, in our private markets, both home ownership and private rental, there's a serious undersupply problem. Currently in New South Wales, we estimate that there's approximately, we're approximately 100,000 units of accommodation short for the, that are both affordable and available to lower income households. Nationwide, that tops over half a million. It's quite significant. Um, and the characteristics of our private markets are well known and they're part of why it's like it is. We've seen house prices for purchase and rental increase far faster than incomes. We've seen that put home ownership out of the reach of many people who once would have been first home owners. We've also seen a significant increase in the number of investors in the market. But the investors are investing not necessarily in new property, but predominantly in older property and in higher priced, well-located property. The exclusion of first homeowners has meant we've got an increased proportion of households renting. 
but we've also got a substantial reduction in the, number, in the proportion of rental housing with rents at the lower end of the market. So we're getting a redevelopment process that's putting our prices up, both for rental and for purchase, and squishing people out. Um, and that's not just squishing poorer people out, it's squishing middle-income people out of a younger generation. There's an intergenerational impact of this that will grow and become quite serious. Now, the, the reasons that why our housing markets are so unaffordable are also extremely well known and well documented, and the only thing stopping anybody fixing it is political will. Um, and the story goes a bit like this. It's nothing to do with a free market. Sometimes I go, well, I wish we had a free market in housing because if we did, it might be a bit fairer. Um, it's all about how governments intervened in our housing markets in ways that benefit some to the detriment of others. So the cycle goes like this. Investors bid up the cost of our housing, expecting returns from their capital gains. This leads to operating losses and from higher debt servicing costs, which in turn leads to a demand for higher returns or requires higher returns um, and higher prices. The cycle is underpinned by negative gearing, which allows more generous deductibility of losses, um, and also by a concessional capital gains tax. The introduction of the 50% capital gains tax discount in 1999 led directly to a sharp increase in prices. In other words, you and I, as taxpayers, are paying for this spiralling house prices. It doesn't make sense. But also added to this scenario is the financial deregulation that made it much easier for people to get access to silly amounts of money. And compounding it even further is an overconsumption of housing amongst the home ownership sector, um, you know, home owner-occupied housing. And that largely is due to the fact that our houses are exempt. Home ownership or owner-occupied housing is exempt from tax. It's exempt from capital gains tax and it's exempt from the asset test for pensions and it's exempt from any sort of death duties or inheritance taxes. People might say, oh, why would you tax those things? But the more that you don't tax those things, the more the family home becomes not the family home, but a place in which you can stash tax-free assets. It becomes the place of basically doing exactly what people complain about the big mining companies doing, avoiding paying tax. But that comes at a price, because the price is that it benefits some and not others. It's all right if you're on this ladder, but if you want to get on it, or if you're squeezed out by it, you'll do very badly. Socially, it's an incredibly divisive policy that causes a lot of hardship. Now, in our social housing system, it's not doing much better in terms of its you know, economic settings. Um, it's a victim of this house price inflation cycle because the more that that goes wonky in our private markets, the more you've got an increase in demand for social housing. At the moment, we've got in New South Wales approximately 60,000 people applied for social, on the list for social housing. And that's a list that's very, very constrained. You have to be poorer than poor to get yourself on it. You can't just apply because you're doing it tough. Um, so you say the underlying demand for affordable housing is in fact much greater than that. Um, spiralling house prices also make it more expensive for our social housing providers to provide the housing and they're getting less money from government. Um, so over the last 20 years what we've seen is a steady decline in the availability and the amount of stock available in our social housing sector. Um, once upon a time it used to grow at about 3,000 units a year um, these days, there's no growth and it's usually, in the last few years, been recording negatives rather than gains. Um, that's seen a change in the role of our social housing sector over the years. No longer is it seen as the place where working families might get housed. Um, it's no longer seen as a place where you might, you know, seek your permanent long-term home. Um, it's now seen very much as a transitional tenure. Um, for people who are doing it tough and they're expected to move on. And it's rationed more and more tightly. Um, it's incredibly tight and hard to get in there. And the tighter it gets rationed, the more that it becomes less publicly popular and acceptable. Because people see their friends and relatives and say, well, why can't they get in there? Um, and it no longer forms that sort of safety net that people can have that there's a place where you can find affordable housing when the private markets don't deliver it to you. Um, 
One of the reasons it's become rationed and so short is the funding reductions. Over the last 15 years, it's lost about 20% of the funding that government used to make available to it. And as a consequence of those cuts and the inability to maintain a growth in the supply, either to meet need or to meet population growth, they've gone for successive rounds of rationing. That in turn has seriously eroded its revenue because so, incomes, rents are charged according to income. So if you haven't got anybody earning an income, then you're not actually able to collect that much in the way of rent. And they, the funding for our social housing providers, for our public housing, has been based largely on being able to raise sufficient money from the rents to cover the operating costs. So that in turn has meant that the maintenance has fallen behind big time. And initially when this cycle started, the housing authorities took the poor person's attitude is how I describe it. They decided to put off the maintenance hoping the rainy day would end um, and they'd be able to pick up the ball later. Um, unlike in New South Wales, they definitely took that line. In South Australia, they took a different line, which is to sell down the stock. So they started selling and lost a lot of stock um, in order to try and meet these funding shortfalls. Needless to say, the rainy day hasn't ended yet and doesn't look like it's going to end any time soon. So the maintenance is actually a serious, serious problem. And compounding on top of that is a legacy of the estate planning of the 60s and 70s, the estate planning that was, in fact, the places where those low-income private tenants got located as their terraces got renovated or pulled down or whatever else. Because of the rationing, they're now being allocated not to low-income working families, but to people with very serious needs. And the isolation away from transport services, all the rest of it, is incredibly problematic. Um, the Auditor General in 2013, New South Wales Auditor General, investigated our social housing system. His report is there for all to see, and it rightly names the problems, and it rightly names the cycle of events that have caused the problems, where we would pick off a pick is with the solution. The Auditor General, instead of saying, you know, anything along the lines of there needs to be a solid injection of money for uh, non-market housing, you don't care how it's delivered, but you know, the market cannot deliver and has proven that it can't deliver, um, it's come out with the recommendation that the Land and Housing Corporation, which is the legal body that owns public housing in New South Wales, must manage within its means. Now, that's a warning for all of us who saw that at the time. That was a very big warning bell because what it meant was two things. One is that the housing would be even more tightly rationed and targeted to the needy of the most needy of the most needy of the most needy. Goodness knows what you need to be. Um, and then what it flagged also was that the value of the land would be unleashed in some way. They would start to sell valuable property in order to try and make ends meet. Um, we're still waiting, even though a couple of years out of date now, or a couple of years we've been waiting. There's meant to be a social housing policy that was released, and recently they, there was a social housing discussion paper released that we all had to respond to, and did. Um, and there's also matching it meant to be an asset portfolio strategy, which we haven't seen yet. Um, the government's responding at that level of bureaucracy, and if the social housing discussion paper is anything to go by, it's not necessarily anything new, but from our point of view, in terms of a objective of trying to have a fair and just housing system, it doesn't leave us very much confidence. It simply deals with social housing as if it is like a little welfare pill, as if it's some self-contained thing rather than a part of a whole housing system, and assumes that somehow they can just ration the pill to make it work. And assume the assumption in there is that somehow or another, goodness knows how, people must be encouraged to find their housing in the private rental market. Our private market somehow will deliver if government isn't mucking around on the sides. Now, government is more than mucking around in the sides. Our central government is mucking around big time in the tax settings, which are causing half the problems. So the only way a state government can respond to that is lobby the Commonwealth government on that issue, or, and or, start to set up the services that will ameliorate the hardship caused by those Commonwealth government settings. We didn't see anything like that in that discussion paper, although we certainly submitted it in our comments on it. Um, I think it's Blind Freddie would tell you that somehow the private rental market, with the settings like it is, with its new investment, and there is new investment in the private rental market taking place, but all at the top end is going to suddenly change tack and start housing very low-income people. It's just not going to happen. 
We're also pretty concerned about the impact of managing within your means, meaning having to release the value of the land. Quite significant amounts of public housing are located on valuable land in the inner city areas, and we would be really concerned about processes that meant our city continued to divide very seriously between rich and poor. Um, and we really need to address some of the, like this, as I said in my introduction, there is money in our housing system. It's, the, it's in our tax expenditures rather than our welfare expenditures, and it needs to be redistributed. Um, if we don't do something like that, and if the people like you know myself of my generation don't start to turn around and say, the tax settings that we have benefited from cannot be maintained forever and we need to share so that others can get a look in and others can simply get a roof over their heads. We need to stop saying it's okay to invest and to hide income and to build assets in the family home at the expense of others getting a roof over their heads at all. Um, there's in, in the paper that I've distributed, the election, there's a whole lot of things that the state government can do to address these issues. Other issues must be addressed by the Commonwealth Government. Thanks.